Good morning, everyone. This is actually the first church that I've ever been to that has sussed out how to not have me scrabbling around at the front as I try to get set up. It's so nice to have a little bit of space to do that. Can you hear me okay? Sound a little bit echoey, but that's all right. It's maybe because I'm between the speakers. Well, it's great to be here, and you know, particularly so because I remember hearing about just the, the idea of this church, of Christ Church Fairham, when Duncan and I would, would go for a walk on a, a Tuesday or something, Duncan, when we were at Bible College, and you know, um, he was dreaming about this, and there were other people who were dreaming about it, and there were prophetic words, and, and I would kind of just watch as this, this story unfolded, and then he went to Portsmouth, and uh, you know, he was, he was on this sort of journey, and then the church was birthed, and so I feel like I've heard quite a lot about Christ Church Fairham, and now I'm actually standing here and you are gathered and you are Christ Church Fairham. And so I'm, yeah, I'm just stoked to be here. It's, um, it's really special for me um, to, to come here this morning and to be with you. I feel I need to tell you that last Sunday, it was actually the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, we had a little bit of a tense time as a family. And uh, we, were, we were in the living room and sort of tension was rising a little bit. And there was a bit of a standoff between my son, Alistair, and I, you know, and things were getting quite intense. And uh, everyone's eyes were on one sort of square foot in, in, in the living room. And uh, there was a sort of battle of wills going on, you know, and the, the tension was really rising. And this was just chess, you know? <laughs> Why, why is it that we like so much to win? Why is it that we, we, we like to kind of think about how to overcome and, 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 and rise just a little bit higher up the pile? And I think, I think the reason for that is that our culture tells us, doesn't it, that if we, if we can sort of overcome... And, 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 and rise up the order a bit, we'll be that much freer. Doesn't it say that to us? You know, if we, if we can win a little bit more and climb a little bit higher, we'll, we'll have more control, we'll be more independent, and so we'll be freer. Uh, we're kind of surrounded by that message, aren't we? And in a sense, what it's tapping into is the fact that we really do want to know that kind of freedom, don't we? And I think the kind of freedom that we're, we're actually looking for is the freedom to be. The freedom to really live. The freedom to be what we feel deep down we were created to be. And when you, when you look at Jesus in the Gospels... You know, Jesus, as far as the world around him was concerned, Jesus was not at the top of the pile, was he? He had no particular status as far as the world around him was concerned. He had very few economic resources. And yet, when you see Jesus in the Gospels, doesn't it stand out to you that he's so amazingly free? You know, he, he is free from the need to impress the people around him. He, he, he's free from sort of fear when, when people oppose him. He's, he's free from that sort of nagging futility. Jesus really knows who he is and why he's on earth. So as far as, you know, I guess our culture would have said, and his culture too, you know, Jesus maybe wasn't very free at all. He didn't have a lot of worldly power, but he is so free that in these situations that would have you and me really phased, Jesus is poised. You know, when, when everything is kind of against him, time and time again, Jesus is wonderfully courageous and at the same time, utterly gentle. You know, where do you get that kind of victory from? 
Where do you get that kind of freedom from? And the answer is, as we're going to see, Jesus is, is that free because he's continually standing in the love of the Father. He's continually living out of that relationship, that oneness that he has with the Father. Jesus is truly free. And that is beautiful to watch, isn't it, in, in the Gospels. But it gets even better than that. Because we, we read in these verses here that, that he's saying to us, there's a way for you and for me to know that kind of freedom. That, that there's a way for, for you and me to, to sort of stand in the love of the Father in just the same way that Jesus did and does. Isn't that amazing? There's a way that we can share the victory and the freedom of Jesus himself and sort of overcome the downward pull of, of the world. And, and there's two, two particular freedoms that we see here, I think, in this part of God's word that I want to highlight. So two headings. I don't know, are you the kind of church that, that like the headings up front or do you like a bit of a journey? Do you like to know both or... Go on, you can vote. Which do you want? Both? Both. both. Okay, both. I think that was both. Okay, free, free, freedom to love and freedom to really live. Okay, freedom to love and freedom to really live. And the first, the first one, freedom to love, is verses 1 to 5 of chapter 5. But we're going to take a little bit of time as well just to dip back into chapter 4 and look at verse 16 as well. You know, the problem with all that sort of grabbing and trying to get ahead and trying to, to win and beat each other is, at the end of the day, that it, it stops us really living and it stops us really loving each other, doesn't it? It has a sort of empty on the inside, a bit sort of shrunken and eaten away on the inside. But, but Jesus' freedom is because he knew the reality of one of the verses here in chapter 4. He knew that reality was the, the overarching, defining reality of his entire life. And it's verse 16, as I said, of chapter 4. I'm just going to read the second half, which tells us that God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This person who, who is living in love is someone who, who is in God, and God is in him. There's that kind of closeness and intimacy. And Jesus tells us several times in, in John's Gospel that, that he is in the Father, do you remember? I'm in the Father, Jesus says, and the Father is in me. And then breathtakingly, he says, I and the Father, therefore, are, are one. And he's talking about a relationship with the Father that he continually stands in, that he continually lives out of, that is, that is so close and, and so intimate and so, so wonderfully full of divine love, a relationship that close that he says, I and the Father are, are one. Can you, can you imagine how beautiful it must be to live continuously aware of that in the way that Jesus was. You know, every, every single thing that you do, you get out of bed in the morning and you know deep down in your heart, I, I, I am the Father, Jesus says, we're one. You know, you walk down the road, I am the Father of one and I, 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 I'm full of his spirit. I don't know, you, um, you go to work in the afternoon and, and it, it's really pressurising, but I know I and the Father are one. This, this is how Jesus lived just absolutely stunning. I mean, if you really grasp that, what, what could touch you, right? I, I, one with the God who, who, who is in charge of everything. One with the God who has life in himself. That is the source of Jesus' freedom. That is the source 
of Jesus' victory. But something about chapter 4, verse 16, if you take a look at it, I'm sorry it's not up behind me, that is really, really special. Because it's not just talking about Jesus' relationship with the Father. It's talking about our relationship with the Son and the Father as well. Because if you read the whole verse, it says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, for you and me. God is love, and whoever abides in love uh, abides in God, and God abides in him. If you're trusting Jesus for yourself this morning, person to person, then you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. There's that union. There's that intimacy, that, that closeness with the Lord. It's a, it's a, kind, of, a kind of oneness, even. Not, not completely the same as the oneness of the, of the Father and the Son in the Trinity, but a relational oneness, right? A fellowship, a communion that is that close. And you see this, this sort of mutual abiding, um, us in God and him in us, us in Christ and Christ in us. All, all the way through this, this kind of middle section of 1 John, so because I know you're working all the way through 1 John, I just want to kind of highlight this to you. You see it in 3 verse 24, um, 4 verse 13, you're keeping up here, 3 verse 24, 4 verse 13, 4 verse 15, and 4 verse 16 that we just read. And so it's really, really important. John is saying, this is the kind of fellowship, this is the kind of relationship, not, not just that Jesus has with the Father, but that you have with him and with the Father. In other words, you, you stand in, or sit, in the same kind of love. You are loved, get this, you. You know, me, with all my um, idiosyncrasies and wrinkles and problems and all the rest of it. You know, we are loved as the Father loves Jesus. Amen? Amen? We are loved as the Father loves Jesus. And then suddenly you go, phew, wow. Okay, now, now I can start to drink in some of that freedom. Now I can start to be a little bit more like Jesus. Now I can start to, to let that love that flows from him to me kind of fill me up and, and spill out a bit to the people around. You're thinking, aren't you, wow, we've got 12 verses in chapter 5 to do and we're on 4 verse 16 at the minute. And, and <laughs> it's all right, we'll, we'll speed up a little bit. This is what it means to be a child of God. It means to, to be loved as the Father loves the Son. It means to be joined to Jesus. It means being one with him. It means, as I think Duncan explained a bit earlier on in the series, it means being in the vine, right? Do you remember that from a few Sundays back? No one nodding. Yeah, a few people nodding. Okay, and because you join to him, and because the Son has life in himself, once you're joined to him, you're alive too. You share his eternal life. You can't die. Nothing can touch you, fundamentally. And that's why you're free. That's why you share in his victory, in his life. And, and you might be sitting there this morning and thinking, oh, I, I, I wonder if that's true of, of little old me. With, with, with my life, I think that sometimes. And, and if you read God's word to you this morning, here in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says to you, everyone, no exceptions, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, has been made alive in this way, has been joined to Jesus, is in the vine, is loved as the Father loves the Son. Everyone. You see, it's not, a, it's not a high hurdle here. 
everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the King, that he's the Lord. And then in verse 5 as well, you know, who is it that, that knows this kind of freedom? Who is it that overcomes the world and its pull away from love? Who is it that knows that except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That he is the centre. That he is the eternal Son. That he is the King. And if that's true of you this morning, then you're in the vine. You're alive. You can't lose. You're free. You're loved as the Father loves the Son. Isn't that amazing? And if you, if you don't yet know that, that reality in your own life, can I, I, I don't know the name of the gentleman who came to the front when we were singing, but you know, do respond in that way. I think we're going to have the chance to respond a little bit later on. If you want to know this, you know, that there's not a high hurdle at all. Jesus just wants you to come to him and say, do you know, I see who you are. I know that you're the Son of God. I want to put my trust in you completely. I want to put my life in your hands. And there's going to be the chance to do that later on. I was thinking about the last time um, that I actually saw you in person, as opposed to on Zoom, with your dog messing around in the background. And I think that was when you came to Abingdon. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Abingdon's this, this really nice town um, just a little bit outside Oxford that has the River Thames kind of running through it. And Duncan and I walked for quite a while, I think that day, by the river. And I can't remember, was it pretty dry when we were there? I can't remember. I can't remember. My memory's really going nowadays. Anyway, the River Thames in Abingdon, sometimes when the water really builds up, you know, upstream, the, the fields around, and there are a lot of open fields there. You'll get up one morning, and they are completely flooded. You know, you can't walk anywhere, way underwater, everywhere that you look. And on a, on a sort of bright, sunny day, it's really beautiful. You know, you get the reflection in the water. And there's, there's just water everywhere. The, uh, the river overflows. And what God is saying to us here in 1 John, one of, the, one of the key things he's saying is that he is like that. He's like that river. He, he, he is love and, and he overflows. But, you know, unlike the, the kind of tiny river Thames, you know, he, he overflows eternally infinitely with love and you're joined to him you know he, he, he's the creator you're, you're, not, you're not the creator you're a creative one but you're loved and you're valued and you're joined to him and you're in him and he's in you he overflows well why am I talking about overflowing second half of of verse 1 of chapter 5, we read that everyone who, who loves the father, or loves the begetter, a bit more literally, loves whoever has been born of him. So, you know, if you're someone who is standing in this love of the father, and, and hey, you can't do that, can you, without loving him back? It's just not, it's just not possible. So if, if, you're, if you're in this, this in one or other relationship with him, you're in him, he, he's in you, then John says, you're going, to be, you're going to be loving the children of God. There's going to be that kind of love in the church. And then because it's John, he gets a little bit circular as you go through these verses, two and three. And you think, what, what is it exactly that he's saying here? Verse 2, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. And you think, whoa, that's a bit of a brain twister. What are you, what are you talking about, John? And I think what he's saying is this. You know, people talk about love within the church a lot, don't they? But 
But what's the, what's the really genuine thing? What's the real thing? And he's saying in verse 2, we know that we're loving each other as God wants us to, as his family, when the source of it is, is the love that we have for God because of the love that he has for us. In other words, really, really genuine love amongst us is an overflow. It's when we've come, isn't it? When, when we've come and we, we've, we've stood in that place and, and, and stayed there for a long time, where we know deep down that the Father who made everything loves us as he loves his Son and we have drunk that in and it has filled us up and we love him. We saw that in our sort of sung worship earlier. And, and our heart kind of starts to brim. And it overflows. I'm not saying we don't have to put in effort sometimes. I'm saying what is, what is the real source of our love for each other? It is spending enough time and really knowing the reality of his love for us. And then, it, and then it overflows. And if we don't stand in that place, you know, if we stand over here and we go, oh, oh no, I'm by other microphones now. And uh, you go, I, I, I don't really want to relate to Jesus. But, but I hear that, you know, kind of to be a good, what did you call it earlier? Not Christian, but Churchian or something. Um, you know, I need, I need to be loving. And we, and we try really, really hard to do it. And, and we go, but, but, you know, actually, I'd... Actually, actually, I, I, I'd rather kind of beat this person. You know, I, I, I'm worried about our pecking order. Um, I, I, I need to grab for myself. I don't feel very free. And of course we don't, because we're, we're cut off from the source of life. We're cut off from the source of love, but we go, I know I've got a love, so, so I'm going to screw myself up to do that. And, and, and it just doesn't work, does it? I know, I tried that for quite a long time. It doesn't work. Other people tried that. It does not work. But if we, if we stand here and we say, Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe in you. I'm not just going to believe that. There's believing that which is important. You see that, that phrase, believes that in verse 1. Um, you see, believes that in verse 5. But in verse 10, you, you, you read, believes in, which is different. And it's John's way of saying... Okay, you believe that this is true. But as well as that, you need to believe in him. Which is a, a sort of Greek way of saying, I trust you. Jesus, I'm trusting you with everything. Some of us can remember a day when we sort of took that step. We said, you know, I, I really am from now on going to give you everything. There's a line in the sand here. I remember a day like that too. And nothing is ever the same again. There is a freedom. There is a, a knowing that God loves me. Not, not just reading about it, but, but knowing it. And then there's a freedom, isn't there? Because I, you know, I'm his son. I share the sonship of Jesus. Wow, what? I, sh I share his freedom. I share his victory. And this isn't about me, but you know, I share his eternal life, and you do too if you're trusting him. And if you want that, can I just say, come to the front a little bit later on and, and, and receive. I have no idea where I am in my notes now. <laughs> you see, this is why, verse 3, his commandments are not burdensome. Because this kind of loving one another, this kind of obedience, it comes out of standing in this place of grace and love and, and letting it flow out. And when you actually think about it in, in, in terms of mission, that's quite an attractive thing to go tell people. You know, it, it's not about churchianity. This is Christianity. Yeah? Standing in a place where the creator of everything, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, loves you with the love that he has in himself. 
That's a message that people want to hear, and it's true. This is the testimony that God has given himself concerning his son and concerning what life is. You read that um, in the later verses here. This is the testimony that God has borne concerning his son, verse 10. Uh, this is the testimony that God gave us this kind of life, the life of the age to come, eternal life, and this life is in his son, Jesus. Okay, freedom, freedom to love. And secondly, freedom to live. Do you see this morning just how much hinges on Jesus? And I just want to say, I, I had those words in my script before Duncan came up and shared that picture of, I think you said compasses, drawing a, a perfect circle with Jesus at the centre. You know, do you see just how much it depends on, hinges on, is centred on Jesus? You know, freedom, that kind of freedom, peace, life, eternal life, everything, because he is the one who is one with the Father, because he is the Son of God, because he is the Christ. And in these verses 6 to 12, I think it's as if, you know, God has just talked about in the earlier verses the kind of love that he wants to see among us, that, that overflow love. And then the Holy Spirit points us afresh to to the source, to, to Jesus, to the one who has life in himself. And, and reminds us, you know, this is, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. This is, this is Jesus who came from heaven, John's Gospel tells us again and again, who, who came to show us truly what God is like, to, to reveal God to us. This is Jesus who, who came in, in the flesh, chapter 4 verse 2 says here of 1 John, and, and who stood, this is God Almighty, God, God the Son, the Eternal Son, who, who comes for you and me and, and stands in your shoes. What kind of God does that? A God who is love, right? A, a God who wants this kind of relationship with you, who actually desires it enough to leave heaven. This is, this is he who came, John says, from heaven is implied there. And he came by water and blood. And then we read in verse 7, well, verse 6, the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. He only tells the truth. And there are three that testify, verse 7. Verse 8, the Spirit and the water and the blood. Oh, now I see why you gave me these verses. <laughs> so what, what is John talking about here? Well, water here stands for baptism, Jesus' baptism. And, and blood stands for Jesus' cross. And so John is reminding us of the, the whole shape of the gospel message, of the, the shape of what you might call Jesus' journey. You could almost think of it like that. Jesus', Jesus sort of um, gospel story. You know, he, he came, he, 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 he took on flesh, and then he, he stands in, in your shoes. And so he identifies with you because he loves you and he submits himself to, to baptism. Why is he doing that? He's doing that because he loves you. He's doing that because he wants you to know his father as your father. He wants you to, to, to be able to sit in 
and drink in that kind of freedom, knowing that you're loved by God the Father, as the Father loves the Son. And so, so he goes down into the water, and Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. You know, that's what it means to be the Son of God. And there's a sense in which that's what it means to be a son of God, small s, and a daughter of God. To, to know the freedom of the heavens open, you know, unhindered relationship with him, and, and knowing his spirit, not just the spirit, but his spirit, his own spirit he gives to you. At the beginning of John's Gospel, John the Baptist says that he saw that too. He saw the Spirit of God, do you remember, chapter 2, coming to, to rest on Jesus and remain on him. And the Spirit was testifying at that point. This is the one. This is the promised one. This is the Messiah. This is the one you're going to tell everyone about. And that's exactly what John the Baptist went and did. And then as we read on in Matthew 3, um, that the Spirit of God has descended like a dove and come to, to remain on Jesus. And, and behold, a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. You see, this gospel message is God's own testimony about his Son as we read here in 1 John. This is God telling you what he's like. This is, this is God himself testifying by his spirit the truth that you can hang on to and that can give you freedom and that can enable you to share in the victory of Jesus, the freedom of Jesus. As I was praying this morning and just kind of reading through my notes, which I usually do on a Sunday just to make sure I can remember what's going on, um, I sense that maybe it's important for, for someone here or perhaps several people here to, to realise that, that those words, this is my beloved son, I am well pleased with you is, is exactly what the Father says to you today if you're trusting Jesus without exception. And that doesn't mean, you know, he, he thinks there's nothing in your life that maybe needs mending and, 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 and sort of growing and changing. It means his fundamental settled attitude to you from everlasting when he chose you to everlasting is that he says to you today as you trust in Christ you are my beloved son or daughter and then the bit maybe that we find quite hard to take hold of I delight in you today the father says that to you, if you're trusting in Jesus, I delight in you. I take pleasure in you. That blows you away, doesn't it? Do we really think, do we really believe that that is the Father's attitude to us? I mean, we know, don't we? But maybe we sort of need to step into it a bit more. The Father delights in you. The Father delights in fellowship with you. Christ loves you in, in that kind of way. And so Jesus has gone through this um, water of, of, of baptism. And then we, we read in verse 7 as well that the cross of Christ testifies to us what God is like. You know, the Son of God has, has, has come in the flesh, stood in your shoes, identified with you in baptism, is, is full of the Spirit, is on mission, welcomes those at the bottom of the pile. Notice. You don't need to do all this worldly overcoming and climbing and grabbing. 
You know, he's willing to meet you where you are. It's true this morning. Wherever you are, he's willing to meet you there. He's the son of God who, who he'll, he'll come wherever. He'll even wash your feet. Jesus will even wash your feet. He'll meet you where you are. And then he goes to the cross for you, where we see God's true glory. The, the, the glory of the ultimate love that frees. You know, if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed, right? Where does it say that? John, somewhere, eight, I think. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And he gives himself to you on the cross and, and for you. You see, he, he really does overflow. He gives from who he is. He doesn't hold anything back. He gives you himself. This is the testimony, verse 11, that God gave. He gave his son. He gave us life. And first time you read that, you think, okay, what I'm being given here is a, a thing, right? God gave us eternal life. And that life is somehow in his son, which sounds a bit technical. But, but when you think a little bit deeper, you realise... What, what God is actually giving you is himself. God is giving you the Son. God is giving you Christ. He's joining you to him and making you alive, putting you in the vine, making you his child. Doesn't, doesn't all this leave you wanting more? You know, wanting to hang out in that love of God more. Want, wanting to drink it in more and overflow more. And I just want to come to a close. I just want to land here by saying, you cannot exhaust Christchurch Fairham, you cannot exhaust his desire to draw near to you. You cannot exhaust his desire to, to lead you further into this kind of freedom. You can't exhaust his desire to to fill you up with his love, just to pour it out so that you can overflow with it to one another as you, as you do life together. I think Duncan's going to come up and, and he's going to lead us in some response. And um, I'm just going to pray before he does that. Father, we just thank you for the astonishing freedom, beauty, privilege. Um, we just thank you, Father, that we get to stand knowing we're, we're loved in this way. Our Father, it is, it is more than we could possibly have hoped for. And uh, we thank you. And we love you, Lord. Amen.